Hello class, I'm here with my esteemed Koi, Professor Jacobo, who I consider an expert on the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, based on the fact that we were taken under the wings of one of the foremost experts in the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, Dr. Griswold del Castillo, who's the one who writes this article. But then Professor Jacobo spent more time than I did researching this, so I'm going to ask him, because this is one of the dense chapters and I think why not invite him, Professor Jacobo to help us out to break through all these questions that you have the ones as you read this chapter keep in mind the following so we're gonna start with number one Professor sure, Jacobo <clears throat> and that's the one that after the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo how did Mexico intend to create a buffer zone okay so it's, it's a very good question so following the Mexican-American War and the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo uh, there was a concern in Mexico of course that uh, the, there will be further American aggression, right? Further desire for the American by the Americans to acquire more Mexican territory, uh, and so part of the idea in Mexico was to create um, a buffer zone near the border with the United States, the new established border under Article Five, uh, with repatriated Mexicans, right? You might recall in Article Eight, uh, uh, in Section One, there was a choice given to the Mexican nationals who were now part of the United States to, to either become U.S. citizens or to go back to Mexico, right? And remain obviously Mexican nationals. Uh, so some people did in, in fact move back to Mexico. We don't know the numbers exactly. Ironically enough, many of them moved to uh, what is now San Arizona, which back then was part of Mexico before the Gatson Treaty of 1853. And uh, uh, this is again part of uh, a desire by the Mexican government to protect these territories by repopulating them with repatriated Mexicans from the United States. That's quite interesting though. I'm right, let's go with number two, and this is the one in California, talking about our state, how the delegates to the state constitutional convention, that's, I'm assuming that's the Californians, mm -hmm. wrestle with the problem of race, rights, of citizenship, and Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. Well, one of the things that we have to always do in this class, Professor Gomez is, and, and students, is think in context. So we have to think in this case, the issues of uh, race uh, and citizenship in that context uh, in time. And so what am I talking about? I'm talking about the fact that really for most of the early American experience, uh, we think of an American as someone that is part of what is known as the WASP, the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant right, population. And so here you have now a treaty that is negotiating the possibility of non-Catholic, non-white, if you will, or mestizos, uh, you know, people becoming U.S. citizens. That was not going to happen without resistance, without, without breaking, if you will, the mold of what an American was you know, back then. And so you do have a major problem at the time with some people uh, who resisted the idea that Mexicans could indeed become, if you will, Americans. Now, we have the reality that some folks uh, fare better maybe the more, uh, the Californios that were of Spanish, Mexican ancestry, uh, that perhaps were more easily included into the new social order. But the truth is that most mestizos, and certainly the Native American peoples of these territories, uh, did not have, or did not fare well, I should say, in that experience. Let's keep in mind, I know this could be confusing, that the Mexican uh, government in the Constitution of 1824 saw the Native peoples uh, of Mexico as Mexican citizens. Yeah, that's the Aguascalientes Constitution. Yes, yeah. sir. Yes, sir. But uh, that when so when the Mexican nation surrenders the territories of the north, uh, and uh, they assumed or believed that the same would be done in the United States, but that's not the case in American political arenas and in American political system. Native people were not seen as citizens. That's why your book in that chapter tells you that. Uh, that the Californios did not fare well, the mestizos in particular, but uh, it was even worse for Native American people who suffered, and this is Ricardo uh, de Castillo's words, uh, he calls it, in fact, um, you know, uh, a massive, massive, massive murder in, in a sense, right? This is really fascinating. Well, let's move on on number three, and this is how did the discovery of gold of 1848 worth the situation for California? I don't know if you remember, Professor Gomez, when we were young, uh, we took a class uh, of California history, 
at San Diego State University and back then Professor Dr. Peterson back then uh, wrote about Manifest Destiny in the Minds. It's a very good reading uh, chapter uh, that maybe you should consider for the future. And so the thing is that many people, of course, in the United States saw that uh, the, the American people as, as let's say, um, fulfilling a destiny right in doubt to them by, by God. And so when God, gold was discovered in California, uh, the assumption was that this is part of this destiny, right? And, and in fact, maybe we can even ironically talk about this. The Spaniards were looking for gold and they never really quite found it in these territories. Yeah. Uh, the Mexicans didn't even have time to look for it, frankly. And then the U.S. comes in, absorbs the land, and boom, gold is, you know, about, the, about that time discovered. Yeah. So there's an assumption that the gold, again, is, is an American... Uh, it own its own. It should be for American people, get white American people in that context. Ironically, now what happens, and you know this from your own research, professor, is that uh, the Mexican uh, people uh, who um, had been miners for generations across the border, right, uh, in, in Chihuahua, Zacatecas, and Guanajuato, in some cases, they were experienced miners for generations. So when they came north, uh, lured by the gold, uh, you know, they were quite successful in their enterprises. And this created uh, animosity, uh, jealousies, resentment that led up to a lot of violence, of course, against yeah. the perceived you know, foreigners who were taking America's gold. One of the things that I, th I find also interesting is, is in, in fact, uh, that will lead to the case of Negli and uh, Paro de la Guerra. Yeah, is, so that's yeah. actually with that question five. But okay. okay, I'm sorry. Well, let me well, let's jump into that if you're, if you're okay with that. Yeah, go ahead. Jump on it. Because now you have sort of like... Um, two Mexicanos, if you will, right? You have the Mexicanos that are going to be in the set territories that used to be part of Mexico, now part of the United States, right? And you have Mexicanos who are coming across the new established border to mine. And the question is, who has the right to mine, right? Uh, is it only the Mexicanos who came, who were here before the treaty, you know, or, you know had been uh, written or, or, or signed? Or is it also the immigrants coming across? Mm -hmm. Negli tries to settle this case and it really fails to do so because there's a lot of ambiguity about which Mexicanos have the right, if they do have the right to mine without, you know, without uh, uh, the eventually taxation, for example. Okay. You know what, this, this question also goes with number four, as you were talking about how Anglo-Americans, they were complaining about those Mexicanos were searching for gold. Mm -hmm. And that's when you have um, his name, the General um, Percy Ford Smith, mm -hmm. who, well, what do, what do I do about with these foreigners? So I let you answer that question. Yeah, well, you know, it, the, it, it triggers, again, a lot of violence, right? Because not only now do you see yourself as, as God has given you land, but what's in the land belongs to you, including, in this case, gold, obviously. So when you have a general that is, is adding fuel the to, to the fire, if you will, right? It leads to, to violence against the Mexican community, uh, regardless of their status or where they came from. Not just the Mexican community, others, anyone that was perceived as the other, as a foreigner. In fact, Professor Gomez, uh, you know, we can talk about the foreign miners tax law, right? That's sort of the culmination of, of, that, uh, of those attacks. Yes, and I was reflecting on the chapter before this because we talked about Joaquin Morrieta and exactly. who experienced, mm -hmm. you know, first-hand violence mm -hmm. exactly. by the Anglo-Americans. Right, let's move on with number six, which is, to me, this is really sad. So what was the fate of the Indi of the Indians, I'm going to call it indigenous, under the Treaty of Guadalupe? What was their fate, you know? Well, Ricardo Grisul Castillo uses the word, it's, it's a strong word, right, genocide. Uh, but if you consider the fact that you have, again, massive, m really murder of Native peoples, uh, the uh, taking violently of their property and their land, and really an exclusion, right, of their communities, uh, uh, it, maybe the word is an appropriate word to, to utilize. The truth of the matter is, as we said earlier, that the treaty did very little to protect people who had uh, power. We'll discuss later on Joseph Ibiz de Montour, for example, right? Uh, so if it did little to protect people with power, economic, political, social power, you can only imagine uh, what little, if anything, it did for Native peoples uh, in the United States. Again, going back to our earlier question, they were not seen as, uh, as uh, you know, uh, people, right? They were seen as almost uh, savage, if you will. And so 
uh, the violence against the community was tremendous and there was little to no protection at all yeah. under the uh, Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. So I think this question goes with number eight, which is the, what was the fate of the Apaches and the Navajo? Yeah, again, uh, similar uh, violence. Uh, it, early on, there was an encouragement uh, by the American authorities for these nations to attack Mexican border towns. Again, I go back to Article 11. It's it's one of those things that people maybe do not know because it's really not discussed even in, in some academic circles. But the I found out that the United States ended up paying more to stop the raids against Mexico by these nations than they paid for the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, for wow. example, for the land that they, they purchased from Mexico. Uh, so early on, there was an encouragement to attack. And eventually, those nations, Navajo and Apache, suffered again uh, the repercussions of that, even from the American government, they be a betrayal, of perhaps of sorts. Yeah. So we're talking about the Apaches and and the Navajos, because we are going to talk a little bit about New Mexico, and that goes with. I know we're jumping on questions, but they're all related. Yes. Number seven is why the Hispanos, I mean, the, in in New Mexico, did not obtain all the rights of U.S. citizens under the terms of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. Mm -hmm. until statehood in 1912. And this is how a lot of the New Mexicans got ripped off because right. they were kind of like up in limbo. But I'll let you... You know, the, the, the book that Richard wrote is called The Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, A Legacy of Conflict, right? Because uh, it leads to a lot of conflict, a lot of tension. One of the things that, that we know that, ha that happens, uh, again, in context, is that we have no idea, especially in Article 8, or when a Mexicano who chooses to become a U.S. citizen, when that happened. Article 9 tried to clarify that by saying it's going to happen when a, uh, at the proper time is what Article 9 says, but nobody really knows what that is. And I really took a case that we'll discuss later on today, People versus the La Guerra in 1869. So, yeah, that's, that's 10. So, yeah. Oh, okay. So, so that, that case finally settles this question. It's, it's a great, great flow here, Professor, because that court case finally settles the question of when a Mexican individual who chose to become a U.S. citizen when that, if you will, privilege was executed. Ironically enough, it says that it happens when a territory becomes a state of the Union, correct? Yes. Now, here's the importance of going back to New Mexico. What does it take, especially in context here, for a territory to become a state? Well, it takes a population number, correct? Mm -hmm. uh, if I'm not mistaken, back then it was 80,000. You might want to check on that, okay? But... You know, it's not just the number. It has to be the right kind of people as well. It has to be, again, in context, white Americans, right? That could become, that could become eventually, uh, again, um, members of a state that would become, uh, I'm sorry, a, a territory that would become a state. Yeah, so these people didn't really count. They didn't, exactly, sorry, exactly. They didn't count. So that's what happens. In California, given the gold rush, you have massive immigration from the East Coast, from the Midwest to California, or white Americans. And that triggered statehood in California in 1850. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it's, it's naturally the, the case that California was the first area where the treaty was tested, if you will, right, in different court cases. In, in New Mexico and in Arizona, for example, as well, the native population remained the majority. There was very few white immigration into those areas, and therefore they didn't become, uh, you know, states until 1912. Now, let's just for the sake of argument put this scenario forward. Let's say you were 20 years old uh, in 1848. Uh, and you choose to become a U.S. citizen, but, but you live in Arizona, right? <laughs> it takes, I don't know, 60 years more before you, your, your dream, if you will, or your choice becomes executed. That's crazy, and that's yeah. why they waited till 1912. Exactly. exactly. That's a long, long time. All right, so let's go with this one. Um, what was the Land Act of 1851, and what was the fate of many Californians? And I think this is the one that is also connected, and let's let's connect this with Botelier versus yes. Dominguez, because I think they go hand in exactly, hand. Exactly, exactly. Well, excellent. Uh, again, probably the uh, hallmark case uh, of land issues is is Botelier versus Dominguez, and it has everything to do with the California Land Law Act of 1851. So you have here now in California uh, a uh, let's say three years after the war uh, a this. Um, uh, demand by the state that all Mexican people prove ownership of property. Okay. So, so it's, a, it's a tremendous burden uh, on a population that lived in the Mexican frontier, given logistics, given the distance, given uh, political instability in Mexico. You have people who uh, were rightful owners, right, of properties. They maybe had been there for generations, but had challenges proving them in the American courts. 
because that's again the caveat that you have now uh, an American uh, let's say system that's saying you need to prove to us okay. what is legitimate now you have different cultures you have the Mexican law and now you have the American law which might have different way views of proving again ownership this will lead to the majority of, of Mexicano, Mexicanos in these territories who own property to lose their land even though they have I'm sorry to interrupt now, even though they have proper titles on those t on those properties and I I believe that they needed to hire lawyers to translate yes, their sir. titles. So it was like a like a really arduous process. Yes. Well, as, uh, according to the literature, it took sometimes time, thirty years to prove that the land was yours. And if you have no money, you have to sell property to pay for the attorneys. Many attorneys, uh, we know for a fact, uh, took advantage of the language barriers. Uh, and there was one case that I know, Juan Cortina, whose mother. Uh, thought she was signing legal representation. She sound, she, sell, she basically sold her property for a dollar. Oh, wow. And so all these things occurred, adding to anger and frustration. But going back to the importance of the case you mentioned earlier, Portillo versus Dominguez, uh, the Dominguez family had plenty of uh, documents, if you will, to prove that their land was theirs. But they did not feel that they were compelled to, to prove this to the California uh, uh, no, uh, state mm -hmm. because no in the Treaty of Lupe Hidalgo did it require them to do so. So this, this is what happens. In the the uh, local and eventually the California Supreme Court um, uh, voted in favor of uh, Dominga Dominguez, saying, yeah, there's nowhere in this document, this Treaty of Lupe Hidalgo, that says you have to prove the land is yours within two years. California is the one that began to do this again because of the competition okay. over, over property. So they have a, a deadline. Yes, exactly. Two years to put the land in this. Okay. Exactly. Good point. And so this case eventually reaches the Supreme Court of the United States uh, where they rule, really an astonishing rule that really uh, uh, demolished, I think, the morale and, and the idea that they truly protect the Mexicanos. Mm. And that is that the Supreme Court says really a couple of things. One, says, listen, any government of the United States, state, local federal at any moment has the right to ask you to prove ownership of anything okay, okay? Uh, and uh, then they argue that uh, they don't want to basically support this particular case because if they did it would create a domino effect for other similar cases that existed and that's kind of a really bad oh, it's say, very right? sketchy yeah. right exactly well if, if you're right but if we say you're right then we're gonna create a bigger problem yeah. right and so again uh, it, at least in that ruling it uh, it seemed to contradict uh, the Constitution of the United States. Yeah, that's, that's question four again. Oh. Yes. Okay, which protects again, um, protects the uh, gives the the caliber, let's say, uh, to international treaties uh, as that of the American Constitution. So to to betray one or to contradict one is to contradict or betray the other one. Uh, if you go back to Bernardo Couto in last week's readings, yes, he kept arguing about how there was American guarantees in the Constitution that will protect international treaties. And of course, that was wrong. It was a little bit emotional. Exactly. And let's go with the last one because you already um, mm -hmm. talked about eight and nine, the guarantees of those mm -hmm. two. But it will be the last question. And what was the outcome of the U.S. Supreme Court case, McKinney versus Saviego? Another excellent co uh, court case uh, to see the, what happens with the treaty while it be And really the question with that Saviego case is, okay, was Texas part of the land that the U.S. Uh, won in the war against Mexico or not. It's interesting because if you ask the Mexican scholars, they'll say that half of the national territory was lost to the United States. If you uh, ask the American scholars historically, they'll say it was a third, right? And the whole difference really is Texas. Okay. Uh, the American perspective tends to be that Texas became was independent and joined the American Union in 1845. That's a part of the Texas Revolt. So exactly, that's like a, exactly. It's a long history. Long history, exactly. And, but the Mexican perspective is, no, 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 this, this was part of a large, really theft from their perspective okay. of, of American uh, aggression, uh, result of American aggression, and it should include, uh, it should be included. Now, when this now goes to the courts, right, uh, Sabiaco was basically arguing, my property should be protected. Okay. Uh, under the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, our rights. And the American Supreme Court decides, no, uh, Texas was independent before uh, the, the war and before the treaty. There are four only articles that, per that pertain to international, let's say, regulations or you know, binational agreements okay. apply to you. Now, Articles 8 and 9, uh, for example. That's, now, that's the last one we have, okay. right? Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, perfect. Uh, so, 
I think if, when you when you um, talk to Chicana Chicano scholars about the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, they will always talk about Articles Eight and Nine as being the, the most important ones. Okay, uh, and that's because Article Eight again uh, does two things. Section One it basically tells you what to do with your pro- what you can do with your property. Remember, you you are it's, it's hard for us to think about this. There's been a war. Mexico lost the war, and now you are really a foreigner in, in, in your native land, if, if I can use the, the, the title from uh, David Weber in this case. So you might be very scared of what's going to happen to you, your family, your property, right? Here, Article 8, Section 1 says, well, there are three things you can do with your property. You can stay where you now reside, mm-hmm. okay, it's your property. Two, in case you escape the violence, uh, you have the right to ownership of, of your land, even in absence. In, in, absence. Mm-hmm. in fact, legally it's called absentee land ownership. Like Dominguez. Like Dominguez. Yeah, Dominguez and Orbotier mm-hmm. or, 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 okay. as well. Probably Botier is a better case for that one. And the third thing you can do is sell you know, your, your property and remove yourself uh, to Mexico, mm-hmm. which is probably where the repatriated people we talked about in the first question, yeah. right, we're, we're looking at. The second part of Article 8 is very promising. Uh, it, it says to you, well, you can become a U.S. citizen if you want to, or remain a Mexican citizen in the United States, kind of like a, like a green card holder. It's Pablo de la Guerra. Right? Exactly. But we do not know, nowhere in Article 8 does it say how it works. Hmm. There, we, today, if you want to become a U.S. citizen, you know the process, correct? Yeah. But back then, no one really knew it was ambiguity. Okay. Article 9 tried to provide some, cl- uh, some clarity without much success. Because all it says is, well, we're going to protect you from your rights, you know, religious rights, uh, certain rights, as if you were a U.S. citizen, well, we figured this out, because you're going to become a U.S. citizen at the proper time. Okay. But when in the world is the proper time, right? And so, again, it did not really do that uh, until the 1869 case uh, in California, Pablo versus de la Guerra. Um, and, uh, again, let's not forget also briefly that there was an Article 10 that protected all the property titles. That's and the that, one that, that was the one that removed. Exactly. Oh. It was deleted by the United States. Okay. How, Interesting history, sir. How convenient. Uh, God, thank you so much. I mean, mm-hmm. if you want to be lazy, I guess you don't have to read the <laughs> chapter, but I'm. you have it from the expert right here, and I, I'm really thankful that we have Professor Jacobo with us. And we're going to be using this um, for your quizzes, so feel free to take notes, highlight it as you read your chapter. Once again, thank you, brother. All right. We'll talk to you later.